I would last six months in a job and someone's just going to come and go, you're terrible at this because you're miserable and we've now fired you. I um, mean, I don't think I've worked for anyone since I was 22. My last waiter job at 23, maybe. That's just, again, I, I found some ups and downs, but I, I kind of had to do it my own way just because there was no other way to do it. <laughs> it just wasn't. Hi, I'm Nick Warner. As a dad, a lucky husband, and as a business coach, I value people and relationships above all else. But next is winning, sustainability, and healthy culture. I've been a business owner for 25 years and served for decades as a special advisor to business and government leaders at all levels. Let's just say I've seen some stuff. My passion and my expertise are helping motivated professionals and businesses find the highest level confluence of what they want in life and business. This is what it feels like to be together at the top. Thank you to our sponsors, Shoals Brick and Rogaski, Three Bridges Consulting, Kathy Olson at Ships and Trips, and Connect Strategies. John Zimmerman is the founder and CEO of Ready Spaces, a storage and warehouse company focused on serving dynamic businesses. Founded seven years ago, the company already has 32 locations across the U.S. and Canada. John's company is uniquely positioned in the $58.2 billion North American self-storage industry to either continue its impressive growth or to be sold to a larger outfit. For disclosure, I'm an angel investor in Ready Spaces, which has given me a middle row seat to view what seems to be a well-run, fast-growing company in a well-documented hot market for storage facilities. From what I can see, Ready Spaces resides somewhere between startup and mature. Like many of our previous guests, John's evolution in business leadership has not been a straight line. In our pre-production interview, he seemed wistful for what's behind him and what could come next for this chronic entrepreneur. I find John very humble and relatable, my favorite kind of leader and the only type of leader I work with or for these days. John Zimmerman, where are you today? And say hello to the people of Together at the Top. Wow, what a beautiful introduction. Thank you, Nick. I'm actually in my home office right now in Marin County, California. And a pleasure to be here. Excited. Thank you. Super fun. Hey, so tell us in your own words what Ready Spaces is and what makes your company different from self-storage we see on every street corner. Happily, we are really catering to uh, the small business owner. I was in the self-storage business for many years and I started really paying attention well before 2010. I started looking at the marketplace and my self-storage facility or several self-storage facilities prior led me to see a niche in the market. So as we know, self-storage is sort of that 25 to 300 square feet. So call it a, let's say a five by 10, 50 to a 10 by 30 at most. And then traditional storage was 5,000 square feet and above. If you're looking at things like uh, commercial condos and those when they got popular over the past 20 years, were all for sale. So there just was a large customer base that seemed to need between about 500 and 2,500 square feet. And I determined that in my first very big self-storage facility, which was called United Store All, and I opened it in, in uh, 2001. As a matter of fact, I sent the check for the deposit for this particular building because I was into the conversion business. I, I wasn't building ground up. I was much more interested in infrastructure and infill and taking what was pre-existing and, and turning it into in something new, which is very much the genesis of what Ready Spaces is today. But we'll, we'll get there uh, soon enough. So I sent a check, believe it or not, on September 8th, 2001, from the World Trade Center. Yeah, I was buying tickets to a show called Proof, and I was going to um, Midtown Manhattan uh, later that night, and uh, I'll never forget it, because uh, while I was only staying five blocks away from the World Trade Center, we drove by my birthday, September 10th, and I was there with my wife and six-month-old child, uh, and we were actually going to go up to the top of the World Trade Center on Sunday the 9th, did not, ended up going out to the beach in um, New Jersey 
where my in-laws are from. And um, the towers came down the next day. And I, and so it just seared in my mind of when I got in this business, I had nothing to do with the business, but I'll never forget that galvanizing moment. I um, mean, it was a very, uh, obviously interesting time. The world settled back down. And I kind of mentioned the stories because it was very hard to go finance this first self-storage facility post 9-11. Got that finally up and running. And ironically enough, I mean, it's pretty fortunate in 2005, I sold. But in that time and even prior to it, well, you mentioned Ready Spaces is seven years old. Yes, Ready Spaces is seven years old, but I had six or seven other iterations of a ready space is well before I even went into the self-storage business. So I'd like to say I've been in this thing for 25 years. And I'll tell you why it's exploded and why we have 32 and why we should get it up to 132 over the next, you know, three to five years. But uh, the eye was always on the businesses that seem to move into traditional self-storage. I had a law firm that had five 10 by 20s, right next to each other in traditional self-storage. And I thought, this is, seems like a mistake. Why don't I just go build a bigger mousetrap? It's uh, self-storage on, on, on steroids, as I like to joke, because, you know, all I did was I took this and I made it, I made it bigger. And no one else was doing it in the industry. And I know why. The price per square foot in self-storage is, is generally higher. It is a really, you know, a box built on, on metrics. And I noticed that with competition as fierce as it is in self-storage, because it's a publicly traded business these days, it's not a mom and pop business. And mine was sort of a mom and pop at the, at the time, uh, relatively small. And I really couldn't continue to compete the way I wanted to. I, I found that dealing with businesses and, and entrepreneurs was actually much more exciting for me. Um, you know, the self-storage business is a wonderful cash cow, but you're not all that involved. And I saw an opportunity to, again, really develop more of what we know of Ready Spaces. And again, it's for small to mid-sized businesses that are doing, you know, what whatever daily commerce they're, they're doing, uh, a lot of merchandise, a lot of moving companies. And I mean, we have 3,000, almost 3,000 customers. I, I would say we touch every aspect of our economy and the type of businesses that we have in there. But it became much more exciting for me to see people like myself, kind of serial entrepreneur, to you know start a business. It is the backbone of the American economy. And we get a service of those people and their, their businesses are very traditional at some level and, and, and some cutting edge and technical. And I'll happily go into all of that if, if we get there. But uh, kind of the genesis was self-storage to business storage. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. It's interesting to hear how you got into it, um, that you identified a niche and that you questioned the premise, quite frankly, that it could be done differently. Is it, we want to learn about ready space as much as we can, but also use it as a case study to learn about business, to learn about building a business. Do you consider it mature now or a startup now? It seems to me it's somewhere in between that space. Oh, I want to say at 32, it's pretty mature, <laughs> you know. But you mentioned 132, so that has me double down on the question. Yeah, really. I think the winds are still blowing behind our sales, because I want to say that during COVID, where we almost tripled in size, it really speaks to how major markets uh, or, or industries, right? Restaurant, retail, office. I mean, they so dramatically changed. I think the New York Times article of maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago, stated that five plus million people, uh, individuals, pulled business licenses because they also saw the writing on the wall. So these traditional businesses all of a sudden were not there. And people had to find a way to make a living. And why not get into the supply chain industry? It's booming. I mean, our success was predicated on, on um, Amazon and to direct-to-consumer 
So, so many people jumped in and who as an entrepreneur doesn't love more entrepreneurship? I mean, it's fantastic. And I love to see people take risks, take a chance. Every summit we have, the people that work for us, I always say, as much as we love you and love to have you, if you have your million dollar idea, you know, you have to go off and do it. It's really cool to control your own fate and destiny and your and your own business. And sometimes you get really lucky as we have. And I think we will continue. And as much as we can do to support entrepreneurship, I think the better. I'm leery maybe of big corporations, <laughs> how they come and go, how they treat their people. I would like to see a lot more people really take uh, a firm hold of their own, uh, you know, their own financial destiny and go for it. Yeah, it makes it attainable. I mean, the spaces I've seen, I've seen like down in the Bay Area, for example, near Stanford, we saw a bunch of like scientists, they look like student scientists using it for a lab, essentially. We saw when we were in South San Francisco, we saw more of a blue collar kind of come in and out. I remember they had an electrician. So they had a front of house, they had a shop and they had people going out to the field, but they were doing a lot of the fixes in these ready spaces, spaces, frankly, they call ready spaces for a reason. So it's a really interesting igniter or incubator for small businesses. Without question, without question, I would say 10% of the business is rather untraditional as in the people that you mentioned, I think it was one, probably 1.1, which was doing hydroponic vegetable growing in with um, conveyor belt and electric uh, or robotic trimming of fruits and vegetables. I think mostly lettuce and tomatoes because the human hand, as I learned over time, uh, contaminates 25% of uh, the food. So while we have people in the field picking food, it's not efficient. And if they nail it, I mean, they are going to have these pods in deserts. Of course, I mean, the way they will be able to feed people throughout the world where water is not accessible, but condensation is everywhere, especially in the desert, they're a game changer. And we have a few game changers, and it's really exciting to see that. But it's equally as exciting to see, to me, the carpet cleaner that could no longer afford to be in Silicon Valley because of Apple and all the rest of them, you know, basically jumping on every building that comes available. So it really allows us to get the blue collar, as you said, and uh, the mainstream and, you know, people that, again, work infrastructure, staging companies and the like that have a really hard time in some locations um, because of economics to, to even operate. So if you think about it, if you have to live 50 miles outside of San Jose, for example, then the cost of driving back and forth with your trucks is cost prohibitive. And, um, you know, making a living makes it uh, a lot more challenging. So I think we really do get to cater to those types of folks, which is, which is cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I think you got a tiger by the tail right now on uh, one going to 32 and 32, maybe going to 132. We'll see. We shall see. Let's back it up a little bit. You set a great stage and a great foundation for explaining ready spaces and took my mediocre explanation and, um, and explained it a lot better. But let's talk about you. Let's talk about entrepreneurship, leadership. Let's learn from the nuts and bolts of your company. My observation, although you dispelled a little bit of this, is your road is crooked, <laughs> nonlinear, as they say. Very much. Your parents must have been like, John, what the heck are you doing? You studied peace and conflict studies at UC Berkeley, and you're involved in and have started companies around comedy, music production, jazz. I mean, I can see how all that leads right to, wait, what, a storage company CEO? <laughs> Please explain what the heck you thought you were going to be when you grew up. Well. I, um, I had a sense I was going to be a businessman in some way, shape, or form. I think very early on, and I'll tell you from the start, I'll tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I think that's generally how all of us get to where we are. Late in my senior year, being a C-minus student, dyslexic, I love learning, but I don't know if I like formal institutions in which to learn in. Um, I always had a very challenging time getting through a day in school. I don't know how my children have done it so seamlessly, but boy, was it a struggle for me. I'll never forget fifth grade. 
looking at the clock. I can't believe I'm 56 years old because I swore the clock that last class from 2.10 to 3 o'clock, it was going backwards. Every day, I'm like Groundhog Day. I'm stuck. I'm going to be continuously 12 and miserable because I can't <laughs> get out of this class soon enough. Don't ask me what it was because I promise you I was not paying attention. All I want to do is go and play soccer, which I, I'm sure I found a way to get out two minutes early and to go off to the fields and go do that. So formal education, not so of interest to me. And yet I come from a family of highly educated people and very supportive and loving people. So my parents, when I told them, hey, I'm not going to college, and they're like, okay, what are you going to go do? And so I worked for a company literally from 18 to 19 years old. I worked for a company called Marin Express, and that was selling basically a plastic coupon and a, and a book that went with it. And I'll tell you, man, I crushed it. I was so happy to get out of school. And I started making, I mean, I graduated in 1985. I think I was making about $3,000 a month, <laughs> you know, and thirty six dollars to $40,000 was, I mean, I was, I felt like a millionaire. It was, I was making a fortune. But I also learned something else, that being a door-to-door salesman uh, is challenging. And uh, I was not going to spend my life doing that. That was a real life lesson for me. And the woman I was dating at the time was like, what, what drives you? And it's sort of, what's your, what's your real passion? And I said, you know, I've always kind of liked acting or I like actors. I like film. And I decided after that to, you know, really focus in on my acting career. Uh, and I moved to New York City when I was just 19 and spent five years in acting school and uh, being a professional. I was in the unions and I was fortunate enough to work. Um, but mostly I worked as a waiter because everyone in New York as an actor is always asked the same thing. What restaurant do you work at? And, um, you know, after five years of knocking around New York City, it did hit me that I did want to finish my education as much as I struggled in school. I thought a formal education at now 23 years old, and I'd already spent kind of like a year and a half at a junior college. So I needed to matriculate and get back into school because I didn't want it hanging over me. I'm not Bill Gates and others who decided to drop out of a Harvard. I really needed to look at kind of a challenge. You know, when you're dyslexic, school is tough. And all of a sudden I was doing well outside of school, but I wanted, I didn't want to regret, you know, I didn't want to look back and say, oh, I should have, you know, finished this. And I, I buckled down. I was a mature student. I was, you know, 23 years old going to UC Berkeley at this point, or maybe I was 24 when I, when I was needed to be there another about a year and a half to two years. And, um, you know, I'm pretty proud of myself to get through that because it was, it's tough. You know, there are a lot of smart people out there and a lot smarter than me. And school was a breeze for them. And so I did what I sort of had to do. And I put my head down and got through it. But the irony is while I was there studying, I was, as you said, a PAX major and PAX majors, peace and conflict studies majors, many of them ended up going into law school. Um, or uh, worked in non-governmental organizations, NGOs, worked for the United Nations. And it was an interesting path to go through that because the other really interesting part about being at Cal is PACs only, you only needed, I think, five core courses. So this is no liberal arts college. Berkeley, you're going to be an engineer, scientist. I mean, right, that's a historian. That's what you're studying. So I really did find a way to take a multitude of really interesting classes. And there I met my future business partner, John Fisher. And we, for five years post Cal, I was a theater producer. So I went from actor to college to, hey, you know what? I still love the entertainment business. And this guy is a genius. And let me just say something about finding brilliant people. 
if I have a skill, I don't know if I'm the brilliant person, but boy, do I find brilliant people to implement and or to help, starting with a John Fisher, who's a genius writer, director, actor. I mean, we had monster hits in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and all over the country. And then, of course, you know, Kevin Petrovic, my next genius business partner, who I will happily talk about at length when we get there about Ready Spaces, and now our current CEO. Um, he's really stepped into the role beautifully. But to go back to John Fisher, it was through these productions and producing. And at the end of a run, I would be kind of like a little bit, not stuck, but I'd be like, what am I going to do with all these props and costumes? What the heck am I going to do now? And I actually put them in a self-storage facility. And as many do, that was the first time I even knew what self-storage was. So that was when I'm 27 and now I'm almost 57. And I walked into this storage facility and I put it in a, I'll never forget it. It was, a, it was an eight by 10. It was 80 square feet and they were charging you like 120 a month. And my mathematical mind was like, hold on, there's somebody's making some money here. They've got a thousand units in six floors. And I started doing the math and I'm talking to the manager and I asked the classic questions as I did as a theater producer, right? You walk into a theater, you count the seats <laughs> and then you count how many shows per week times, I think at the time, $25 per seat. And you could very quickly figure out what your t potential grows can be and, and then back it off your expenses and let's see if it's profitable. So I kind of did the exact same thing. And when I found out that the owner of this particular self-storage facility, I think had five of them at the time and was living in Hawaii and he had 12 employees. Oh boy, light bulb at 27. I'm like, ding, ding, ding. I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, but I want to be in the residual money-making business. That's what I definitely want to do. I wanted to find something that could make money while I was sleeping. And I really just set a course to do that because, I mean, again, to be frank and honest, I saw then my fiance and then soon to be wife just waking up every day, having to crush it as a CPA to make a living. And everyone else was working hard. And I didn't want to. I'll be honest, man. I just wanted to work smart and I wanted to work as little as possible. I, Furious that I didn't write the four hour work week. I mean, Tim Ferriss beat me to it by 20 years, but I've been trying to live it as much as I possibly could because I wanted to, as Frank Sinatra said, I wanted to do it my way, man. I really wanted to do it my way. And I wanted to make big money. I mean, I'm not shy to admit it. No one was going to hire me, not with me, not with my skill set. Uh, you know, I was a pretty decent sales guy, but no one was going to pay me the money that I was hoping to make unless I was willing to take, you know, the risk, you know, risk it for the biscuit. And I've taken some big risks and woo, if I failed as well, there have been some real failures. So I just set out on that course and I just stayed with it. And I was able to do a lot of other beautiful, wonderful things with my life along the way, which was still to perform produce shows, play with my kids. I coach them for years. I've been fortunate, man. I've been fortunate, but also I stuck with it. And that was the, you know, the other part about it. And I really rode the ups and downs. I'll tell you about the ugly. I mean, in 2008, uh, nine, things got pretty challenging, even in the business, because everything kind of froze up. Some of my uh, early um, customers who are in the furniture business because now, right now, I'm back in to self storage and really into what looks like ready spaces today. It started to become pretty challenging uh, for a while, and then by 2010, there are other things that really hit home. My health got really bad. I had a very serious neck injury. I had to have neck surgery, uh, and that put me down for. I must say nine months to a year. And in that time, I then also was getting divorced, which made life very, very challenging for me as well. And I say that because 
depending on who's listening to this and who's hearing it, and if I can inspire others in any way, it was a dark time, man. It was a really challenging dark time for a business to go down, for my health to go down, and for my marriage to end. For two and a half years, brother, I'll tell you, it was tough. It was just tough. And I just barely weathered the storm of all of it. And then I like to tell this story. I haven't told it often, but like kind of a Super Bowl, I went down so hard and fast. But that ball, when it hit the ground, when I went to the bottom, man, I bounced so much higher than I ever expected to bounce. I mean it. I thought I was happy making a pretty solid living in just owning one of these, what was called custom space at the time. It was doing well. And then that Super Bowl went banging. And I'm like, oh, let's ride this thing. You know, and Kevin up all of a sudden appeared. Kevin Petrovic, who used to own uh, and started at the age of the tender age of 18. Uh, and I think by 19 raised, you know, his partner raised $50 million to start a company called Flight Car. He was my, one of my first customers. And I saw his tenacious 19 year old man. He was so tenacious. I was like, who is this kid? Every month I'd see him and he'd open a new location. And so we built a friendship over a year and a half. And I'm like, Kevin, I'm going to start opening custom spaces wherever you open a flight car. You'll be my, you know, anchor tenant. And we just, um, we, uh, you know, our friendship grew. He kind of liked the idea of it. He had an opportunity to, to sell the company to uh, Mercedes Benz of North America. And he sold it. And, you know, I chased him for about three months. And I'm like, Kev, I'm convinced that this business of mine can go across the country. And, you know, I think he obviously agreed with me at some point and started crunching numbers because he's the ultimate numbers cruncher. I always say he's the numbers guy and I'm the letters guy in, in the company. And we start off slowly. <laughs> it's challenging to start a business in the sense, not start a business, but start something that's non-traditional and it's non, right? You think, oh, all they did was build a bigger box and self-storage. Well, self-storage folks weren't all then interested in investing because they knew what self-storage was. And that's all based on a 10 by 10 uh, metrics. So, you know, we slowly started to grow and we could not keep up with demand. We could not keep up with demand. It was extraordinary, this, this niche. And this is obviously pre-pandemic when traditional, these traditional industries I mentioned were already you know, we're flourishing still, the retail and the restaurant and so forth. And so it became contagious, but at the same time, rather challenging to go get financing from banks because we didn't own property. And if we tried to buy these, these buildings, the economics were not, they just weren't solid. It was just a challenging time to grow, even though we, we could barely keep up with demand because again, investors like track records. We had none. We didn't have any real big money ourselves. And, uh, you know, we grew organically. And again, it was, it was exciting to see the people and the customers that were moving in and to see what they were doing. And, you know, then we picked up obviously some traction and then everything like the whole world one stopped again, March 20th of 2020. And I can tell you, I assume we'd be out of business like everybody else. I mean, I, like we didn't know. Um, what was happening. And within six weeks between talking to our brokers who were saying, Hey, Amazon is, they're snatching up everything. And I'm like, what? Well, we better dig into that. And our own phone calls to our call center started to pick up as well. And we're like, Holy smokes, we have more calls than ever. We better keep growing to keep up with the pace and the demand. And, um, you know, we did, and uh, we've been very lucky. I mean, we're just right, right place, right time, right business. I had friends that own major retail centers and, and the like, and, and, you know, they got crushed, but, you know, six months earlier, they were killing it. So I, I really do feel blessed and fortunate 
to pick the right thing. And, and we were ready, Fred Reddy's basis. We were very ready to take advantage because we had our own infrastructure. We had a good, solid team of people which were ready to also jump on sort of the opportunity. And we've ridden it, man. I mean, we've really ridden it. We appreciate your time. If you like what you've heard so far, do me a favor and leave a five-star review and share with your friends. We'll be right back. The law firm of Scholes, Brick, and Rogowski is a go-to partner for me. I work the most with partner Michael Rogowski. I go to them for business contracts, strategic legal counsel to maneuver through our round complex business situations, HR and employee issues, startup needs, intellectual property protections, collection matters, and recently the purchase or sale of a business. I really like the fact they tell me if they're not the best fit and they give me a warm referral if I need it. Also, unlike so many attorneys are totally level-headed and calm. I've experienced it like their slogan says, small firm service, large firm result. Contact Michael Rogaski at sbrlawsd.com. Kathy Olson at Ships and Trips is as creative and as willing a travel partner as you can find. These days, you can plan a lot of trips on your own, but for those trips that require more intricate planning, tons of time or local contacts and savvy, Kathy's the best. My family and friends have worked with her countless times in every travel country, setting and season you can think of. Contact Kathy with a C at shipsandtripstravel.com. Two things I want to hear more about. There's actually 10 things, but the next two things are um, you, you were the founder and you did this with your arts and entertainment companies too, but all of a sudden you bring in somebody else. So when you go from, I found this, it was my idea, you saw the niche, you invested your money. Now you have somebody else. Now you have a partner with you. I'm focused more on ready spaces, but the dynamic for you is you go find a smart partner that's good at something you're not great at, or maybe you suck at. What are those first few meetings like when you own it all, control it all, it's yours, and now all of a sudden it's not? Because you have partners, co-pilots in that room. How does that, how do you launch from there, reconstituted as a team and not just John Zimmerman entrepreneur? In both of my cases with the John Fisher and the Kevin Petrovic, it was time. We spent, you know, when I was at Cal, John Fisher was a graduate student and he was producing shows there. And all of those shows that you produced on campus, I took professionally and moved them from 50 seats into 500 seats to then the Aspen Comedy Festival with HBO. So I had a preview of everything that I was going to do and a relationship that was so contentious to start <laughs> because John Fisher was, I mean, he's just a true director, a theater director. They have to control every aspect of it. And I was a New York actor and I'm like, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I know exactly what I'm doing. He's like, no, you don't. And that was the beginning of our incredible friendship and, and, <laughs> and, rela and relationship. And that was simply because I saw him, I saw what he was doing. And if I hadn't lived in New York and LA for those six years prior, seven years, about six years prior, I would have known what a genius he was. And let me tell you what a genius he was. I wasn't the only guy. I got Rollins and Joffe. Charles Joffe specifically, who produced Nichols and May, who you probably maybe have heard of. Mike Nichols is a big time director. I don't know if he's still alive. I hope he is. He's a genius. And then we're talking about Billy Crystal and Robin Williams and produced every Woody Allen movie for the first 30 of them. These guys had five people in their stable and um, Letterman, David Letterman. They had five performers. And that's how they built their in, entire career. So the next guy they picked up, John Fisher. I mean, that's how talented he was. And they opened many a doors for us. So if I was the only guy who thought John Fisher was a great talent, I'm not sure if we were, would be here, but enough others, especially real pros saw that. And again, I built a relationship and I said, John, let's start producing shows together in San Francisco. And that's the way kind of that rolled, but contentious, definitely at the start until we realized he's um, back of the house, which is writer, director, actor, and I'm staying in front of the house. You know, I'm getting dealing with the box office and the hiring. So the, yeah. 
some version of he's good at numbers and you're good at letters. Different, but that was a brilliant way to say it. He's good at something you're not. And you connect up in the middle. Exactly. And with Kevin, again, I saw him for a year and a half. Every month he'd open a new flight car location. And so the proof was in the pudding. And, and he's such a, was such a smart you know, kid. And again, I met him in 19. I think he's 30 now or real close, made 28, 29. So I had a preview. Kevin, at the start, it was a little bit easier to kind of build a professional relationship with than, than John Fisher. But, uh, you know, trust me, Kevin and I have definitely butted heads because that's what you do when you're uh, in business because you're married. Let's face it, there's no real difference I found between a marriage and a business marriage. And uh, you're going to have differences of opinion and how to move forward. But we did say early on, sat down and we wrote, unbeknownst to each other, the number of facilities we'd like to open. We wrote this on a piece of paper. We put them on the table. We switched them and flipped them. And you know what they said? 30. Identical. We want to build 30. And we did. You know, and our this beauty of this business, it's so simple when you can boil down the goal. It's so then so simple because all we said is, okay, 30. And then we found our way to, to 30. There are people that are looking to help us get to 130. And they have the finances, the resources, the expertise to really help us get there as well. And, and I don't even mean just in this country. I know that this particular business is, is certainly um, primed to be an international corporation. And it will be interesting to see us get there. I mean, I don't know if you count one facility in Canada as being an inter international business, but technically it is. We like to see. You got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. I, we'll see more in Toronto and other parts of, of Canada. On that point, you work in cities all over the country, and you mentioned now in Vancouver area of British Columbia. Our last guest, Mike Mazza, who runs a construction company out of Florida, says, when you're doing business in other cities or maybe in other states, you want to approach it like you're, quote, in somebody else's home. How do you think about posting up and setting up in a new geography? Do you hire local? Do you build off from there? Do you parachute in and start figuring stuff out like, say, Uber used to do? We certainly hire locally. And we have people, we have trainers that are going to visit. And then they're going to come to a Bay Area location to also train. We do a lot of feasibility and due diligence. We are not going to just open anywhere. We've let our competition do some of that. And we finally do have some competition that's out there, which by the way, completely legitimized us. As much as I, you know, when you're first starting out and you're rolling, you're like, I don't want any competition whatsoever. But we got to a certain size and people are like, hmm, pretty good model. I think we want to start to copy it. But we are really looking for home runs. So we do, we really kind of understand our demographics and, and how we model. So there are some cities that someone like yourself is doing some research where you're like, hey, why are you in that particular city? Well, I'll tell you, we've done enough research to know exactly why um, without giving up any of the real kind of secret sauce um, because we really own market share and we want to continue to, to do so. But uh, to answer the direct question is, yeah, we're certainly going to uh, hire locally. And what's cool about, I think, again, Kevin and I have never worked in corporations, in, in, for a corporation. Uh, here we own it and, and operate a corporation. We certainly do it uniquely, so I'm told, by all the people that have worked either for us or with us now who've left big corporations. And I want to empower people. I mean, that's the bottom line. When, when we do the interview process, especially when I was in, much more involved with, with managers, facility managers, you know, I would say to them, this is your baby. You got to run with this thing. You know, we're not going to be looking over your shoulder. We do not micromanage. We will never set you up to fail. We, you know, we'll give you a container. We'll give you a sort of, you know, structure of kind of rules and regs to follow. But, you know, we're looking for kind of entrepreneurial spirit and please collaborate with us. I mean, our summits, you know, that have grown to 60, close to 60 people, we rely on those folks to tell us what to do, how to make a shift and a change, what policies and procedures that we need to put in. 
I don't like hierarchy, man. I don't. I've never been a fan of it. I certainly don't like authority. I mean, I went to Berkeley. Come on, we're anti, you know, anti, anti-establishment cow. Um, I really want people to feel like we're really a part of a team. And I, I get that sense that that is the case. And we put in changes, really significant ones, every time we leave that summit. And so I'm, you know, I'm pretty proud of how we operate and how we empower our people. And I, I hope to always see that as we grow, because I guess the danger of growth, the rapid growth is you have to become probably more corporate and more rules and regs to follow. And I, I don't want to lose the spirit of what Ready Spaces is. And, and I love hearing from some of the people that's like Chris in Houston has been with us for five years. And we had many conversations of him leaving. I think he left Enterprise Car Rental from mid-management. And he told me within the first either six months or a year, he's like, my wife has seen such a dramatic change in, in him. And how excited he was to open, operate, uh, market, and get uh, the first of a few ready spaces in Texas up and operational. And I've heard that story, you know, a lot. At the same time, not everyone stays with us. There's other opportunities, of course. But I hope that we will continue to find and groom folks that are, you know, looking to you know, kind of carve their own niche as well and be excited to go to work and not be a, a cog in, in the wheel. Because I could tell you, it's not something I wanted and it's not something I expect from others, even though they're sort of in our, in our downline or, you know, they're working for us. So that's really important. Yeah, I appreciate her and all that culturally. It's all really interesting evolution. Culture is important. I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit and get a little deeper into your boardroom and deeper into you aligning with brilliant people and how that evolves over time. Because there's the getting into the posture, which was different for you in two different places. You know, one had a lot of leverage in the market, was very experienced, had strong opinions. One was a 19 year old go getter who was developing a track record. And so both are different. Let me just give you a level set with a quote here. According to the Harvard Business Review in 2022, quote, on average, we found that while founders add the most value as CEOs in the early years of a firm's development, by the six-year mark, they become more valuable in non-CEO positions, such as CTO or a board seat. How do you think about packaging an organization for sale or the next generation of leaders, essentially taking the founder's DNA out of it altogether and turning it over to the next generation of leader or leaders? How's that going? How do you process that? And what does it look like? One, we've done it. I mean, the timing, it's ironic <laughs> that... That quote is exactly what we're living, right? I mean, it was kind of year six and a half when Kevin, to me, was very prepared, especially because he's our numbers guy. You know, he was COO and, and touched every aspect of the business. And I would, without question, agree that, you know, at some point, you got to let the best people run with it. And yet at the same time, I'll be honest, it's challenging. I mean... This is what I've done for years. It's what I know. And yet, Kevin is really, in a way, much better. I wouldn't say just prepared, but he, after seven years, he's, it's time. And it was time to hand it over to let this thing bloom. And at the same time, there are groups circling that, you know, want to, again, invest a lot of money. And they would probably, you know, again, with their expertise, they can run with it in a, in a different fashion because they've grown big, they've grown small businesses into big ones. And I think I'd be great on the board as an advisor, uh, which I'm kind of in the position currently. I mean, I think my title is chairman at this point, but I agree. I think it's time for the next generation to, to really uh, run with it. And uh, when you run into problems, sure, give me a call. I generally can answer my phone on the golf course. Uh, if not, I will, <laughs> at the turn, I'll call you back. It works in the trees or on the water looking for your ball, your phone? Of course, because it, and let me tell you why, because I'm always in the trees. And the <laughs> uh, lucky guess, lucky guess. Yeah, it's of course. 
you mentioned coaching a couple of times to me in pre-production. You mentioned coaching. And to be honest, I didn't want to ask you then because I wanted to ask you live. I didn't know if you're the coach, you get coaching. But tell us about your experience with coaching, your thoughts on coaching, business coaching, that is. Yeah, I have had an opportunity with someone that I know who is transitioning from the entertainment business into a professional coach, a business coach, life coach. And we decided to work together in his transition. And we literally go every other week where I'd be coaching him or he would be coaching me to refine his skills, to refine a bit of mine. And as you are doing yourself, it's so personal and it's really an incredible process to look at someone to say, hey, here are your shortcomings. This is where you're strong. This is where, you're, you know, you really need to focus. And I've really been blessed and totally uh, surprised by what we've learned from each other. You know, as the CEO of a mid-sized company, you might, you still call it maybe a startup. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I don't think so. It's mid-sized and on its way to something else. Indeed. But you know what you don't do is you really don't have a lot of interaction as you once did. And you're kind of removed from the people a bit. Because again, I, I'm, we're not micromanagers. We never want to be. So I've really enjoyed diving in and deep diving every other week with someone who's brilliant and wants to make a big transition and then has done so. And to see him in a year and a half go from no clients to 14 clients and what he can do for them has been great. And in reverse, you know, he's working with people that are transitioning and exiting out of their businesses. And ironically enough, all of a sudden, I'm kind of in the same place. And what does one do in that transition? Um, I learned some very valuable advice from an 80, I want to say he's probably 82, 83 year old. He's an antitrust attorney, one of the biggest in the country. He has done this for so many years and will never stop. I mean, he loves it. He loves uh, deposing CEOs and catching them in whatever, whatever stories they've chosen to tell. But this is what he does. Uh, he represents, you know, some sort of be a kind of class action or, you know, antitrust. And he has his CEOs literally sign a document that says, because of more than likeliness, there will be a settlement. What are they going to do over the next five years? like year one, year two. He's not just going to bring them on as clients. He's going to say to them, you need to have a clear path moving forward or I will not work with you because I've seen too many times that someone sells, they play golf for a year, they're then bored out of their minds and they don't know what to do with themselves other than regret selling their business. And he said, you have to have a great passion for something or you've got to be so angry about something else that you want to make some real significant change. And I would say working with my coach, it's really getting concise and clear on how to honor the thing that I really care about and love the most. And as much as I've been, I've had great success with the Ready Spaces. And it's been an incredible vehicle for me to, again, allow me to have the time to jump into other things that I also really love to do. It's probably time to really focus in and spend the time developing my seven part mini series, which I'm attempting to do that's based in Cuba and around the Cuban Missile Crisis and Castro coming into power, which has been very exciting to do. Um, I'm, re, I'm starting to produce plays again. I have a show that we're supposed to open in January in New York and you know, just honor the things that I really like. And, you know, again, get out of the way and let the next generation flourish with the ready spaces and go back into, I've been performing again for the last couple of years, which has been extraordinary. I, I believe it or not, my, I have a side hustle. I work for the police academy and I work with California detectives for um, their continuing hours, their continuing education. It's, and it's all around interrogation and interrogation techniques. And I got to play all these different characters. I mean, it's really interesting stuff. You know what I mean? I got to play a Southern guy who's a, who's a homeless guy who was attacked 
and uh, I've been homeless for the last five years. I uh, don't trust many people. And uh, it's a rather challenging character to play. It's a sad character, but uh, and doesn't want to really help the police. He's afraid of retaliation. So I got to go into character. And characters are fun, man. And I forget to play a Harvey Weinstein character. And I have like 37 counts of con- sexual assault against me. Never proven guilty. And I get to play a cat and mouse game with these cops and these detectives. And I love the police. I am now all about refunding the police. These are people that dedicate their lives to keep us safe. And I think it's been the most interesting acting I've ever done. And I just want to do more of that too. So I'm in a good position to do it. And I'll continue on. Well, you're lucky you have passions. I do, man. We appreciate your time. If you like what you've heard so far, do me a favor and leave a five-star review and share with your friends. We'll be right back. Three Bridges Consulting did the video on the recently rebranded NickWarnerConsulting.com. I really love the video because it helps me sell by speaking directly to my prospective clients. Dennis and Sean at Three Bridges Consulting are high-level storytellers for the purpose of helping my prospective coaching clients understand what differentiates me from the pack. A recent new coaching client literally said to me, you don't need to sell me, Nick. Your video sold me. I understand what you do and how you work with me as a client. That is a true story. You know I love that. Contact 3BC at 3bridgesconsulting.co. Chan and his team at Connect Strategies head up my post-rebrand digital marketing campaign. I'm moving up the rankings for business coaches and consultants quickly. Connect is 20 years in the business, and I feel like they're really focused on my account. I refer business coaching clients to Connect to, and I get really good reports on result, professionalism, and drive. Thank you, Connect. Contact Ken at K-N-E-C-H-T strategies.com. Tell us one last thing before uh, my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the show. My favorite part is you showing up and us get to learn from you. After that, I want to summarize some of the things we've learned from you today for the listeners. But I haven't asked you about family and role of family. You touched on the importance of family. You raved about your kids' academic acumen. Tell us through the good, the bad, the hard. Like, what role has family played for you foundationally and ongoing? Again, I tried to set up my life as at least a father to really be here for them. I'm not sure if I was a helicopter parent or whatever or snow. I don't think I was any of those things, but my tombstone will definitely say he was around. <laughs> he was a dad that was there and, par- and participated in all my good sports and extracurricular activities. And I mean, I coach my kids I, for like three, four years of baseball and soccer and basketball, CYO. I wanted to do that. And was it, am I the best father in the world? No. You know, my son and I definitely butt heads. Getting divorced was a very challenging time. But, you know, we're kind of on the other side of it. And I've got a 20-year-old who wants to be, who goes to Michigan, my daughter, and she's looking to become a physician. And she's in pre-med. And I have a son who's a, just graduated from Cal Poly and a Jacob. And he's now a commercial real estate broker living in San Francisco. And man, is it cool to have grown-up kids. Wow. It's really interesting to see what they've become and how they've evolved. And they and my family, we're tight. You know, we cousins, uh, we spend a lot of time together. So family has been crucial for me. My dad, who's now 82, comes, he lives in Mexico most of his, most of the days, but he, he's back. He spends a few months, uh, a year here. He actually right in my house. So I get to see a lot of him and my mother lives a half an hour away. So they've been uh, obviously very influential in um, be it the human I am, the education that I have, and the freedom that they've allowed me to literally, as I mean, if someone sees this, they're like, that's a screwball career. What, what was this? This guy did a lot of different kooky things. And um, maybe I have, but again, I did it my way. And I just went on things that seemed to really feel right. And my parents are like, great, go do it. They trusted me the way I trust my kids. I'm like, you guys will be fine. I know you'll be anxious and nervous about your careers and if you're doing the right thing, but 
you will be fine. You've got a solid, solid foundation. So I would say I got a pretty good, solid foundation. Yeah, really cool. A lot of your promises, winner need be present. Like you've really made showing up for people and for your kids a priority in your life. Respect that a lot. You saw a niche. You questioned the premise. I mean, some of this starts really early on with the way your wheels are turning. Hey, that doesn't make sense to me. Or, boy, somebody's making some money here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they're bigger than we are. We got to step up, compete. I really like your early look at sales. It was door to door sales. And, you know, we've been blessed to interview some top leaders around the country in different industries, you being one. I'm not sure there's one common thing or that hustle is a common thing. There's no question hard work and grind is a common denominator. But one of the common de denominators, not universal, but um, in spaces is an early look into sales, for example, thinking like, I like this. This is cool. I need a better product. But right away, it sounds like you lit up on sales and that's not uh, unique, totally unique. Some of the most successful people's, whether it's a sandwich shop or a, a tanning salon or like a door to door salesman or a Troy Parrish, who's a CEO of Flag Golf, was selling copiers and realized, I really like adding value here. My product stinks, um, but I think I really like that. And you got back to that. Another thing you mentioned that I think is really interesting is you went school, work, school, work. And I'm the kind of person, especially in, as a coach, there's a lot of teaching involved and a lot of learning for me as well. But it's really helpful when people can get actual real work experience and then come back to the academia. And I think you benefited from that, it sounds like, in both your businesses. Well said. I, you nailed it. I, I agree. Again, I didn't. School was not, if school is a challenge, but also it wasn't something of interest until I hit the real world. And then I thought, wow, I really do want to go back and, and sharpen my skill set and, and get through and get a college education. And it really did open me up to a whole different world of opportunities and to see the world rather differently. I mean, literally from my art history class to, you know, my economics class to, to you know, all the things in which I did study. So um, while it was a grind and it was <laughs> much harder to get through than I wanted it to be, uh, I didn't always flourish. I did get through it. And, uh, you know, as a C student in high school, I became an honors student at UC Berkeley. So I, but that was only because of maturity. That was it. Well, because you had seen something, you're now based on your education against real world experience and realizing, okay, I need to learn this to be able to go back to New York or go back to storage and figure something out. So you're baselining it against, and I see that in my coaching. It's one thing if I have a, I have a couple college, their interns and a couple really young, like 23, 24, 25, we're mostly talking about theoretical application, but as they get into the workforce and they bring me actual real life situations, that's a really great place to learn and teach and grow the actual situations. Uh, you mentioned there's a lot of brilliant people. You found a couple of them or a few of them and partners, Kevin being one. I'm lucky me for Kevin as well. Thank you for all of us who are involved in the company for Kevin. For sure. But you mentioned there's a lot of smart people and there's a lot of smart people, John. Like I'm pretty smart. You're pretty smart. I'm nothing compared, but that's not necessarily where it's at. It made me think of one of my favorite books when you said that emotional intelligence 2.0, which does a phenomenal job documenting all the smart people. And then what are the differentiators? the probative questions, the questioning, the premise, the surrounding yourself with great people, the outworking people, the humility to say things like, oh boy, I never considered that. Maybe we should do that. That's the next level the emotional intelligence. So I appreciate the way you baseline against, boy, there's a lot of smart people out there. That's not necessarily where it's at. I like your use of metrics. Hope is not a strategy. If you've worked for me, worked with me, had me in your company, you'll hear me say, hope is not a strategy. Like there's a lot of hope involved in this. You push hope to the side and you've used metrics. You've also trusted your gut and you talk about um, creating experience and relations with people on the front end. You basically interviewed your partners for years before you ever approached them with, in that type of posture, but you're using metrics. You're not guessing. You're taking the guesswork out everywhere you can, correct? Yeah, <laughs> without question. I don't take many flyers. The few times that I have, I feel like I probably, I got a little burned and the only successes that I've had is with partners. So when you pose that question, as you did earlier, the things I've done on my own have, have a modicum of success. My successes have always come in partnership. And yes, there will be butting of heads. But I mean, show me a corporation that doesn't have 
hundreds if not thousands of people you i love what you just said i'm shaking my head I, I know you're looking like i'm shaking my head you're wrong i love what you just said yeah i love it you don't you do it in partnership you might be like the guy that started it but when you want to get smarter surround yourself with smart people and, oh i just got so much smarter and better watch this yeah i mean i know a young guy who's a bitcoin well he's not a, he's made a lot of money in bitcoin he's 23 years old even he who left high school, by the way, as a sophomore. I told his parents, he's like, I want to get out of high school and go into, into specifically buying Bitcoin. And he had two partners. Even at 17, they started, and now they manage $100 million in Bitcoin. It was a partnership. I mean, that's the way you have to have generally someone to bounce ideas off of because I can tell you not all my ideas are good. And same on the other side. So it, it really helps. Yeah, it really helps. Yeah. And your mention of business coaching, it leads right to business coaching because that's a lot of that. People misunderstand. I, you said your, your colleague has a handful of clients, six or seven. I, I'm three years in. I have 52 in six organizations that I do organizational consulting with. I'm pretty darn good at it. But I, people think, what do you tell your clients? Like, I don't tell my clients stuff. I pair with really smart people, really accomplished people and humble people like you. You do not need to have a business coach. And my guess is neither does your colleague need to have a business coach. It's not about that. It can be. I've had three in my life before I became one. I have had three and one was under extreme duress. I was super stressed. I could not see the playing field. I had never grown a business. I started it and got it there, but I got really blurry and over my skis. And that really helped me kind of reset, see the playing field. The other business coaches I had and the vast majority of my clients, this is true for John. We play offense. We do not play defense. They are not coming to me in deficit. They're coming to me well positioned and looking for fresh informed input and we play executive tennis or emerging leader tennis meaning like we lob ideas back and forth so you dispelling the notion you may not have meant to but business coaching isn't frankly it can be wasted on remedial like you need to earn your way into high level business coaching and it should be a reward it should be used to play offense and to figure things out not to untangle fishing knots because your life's a mess it's much better to lean forward than backward in business coaching in my opinion yeah, well said. I completely agree with you. And I think what Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Zajon, Jay-Z2, as we call him, I'm Jay-Z1, John Zimmerman. Um, so Jay-Z1 and 2 talk a lot about what is the value add as, as a coach. And he even brought me in because he's, you know, he didn't start a business as I've done and tried to exit out, but he has someone who is in that process. And you say, Kate, hey, would you jump on the phone for half an hour with this person? And man, it was great because boy, did we connect to being entrepreneurs and what does it mean to try to package something? And like, what are you selling exactly? And how are you going to participate and all of that? And I think what JC has really brought out, which is intriguing to me, and, and I'm looking at being a coach myself, is as an entrepreneur, if you're running your own business, you're not in partnership. It's hard to do it alone. And what he brings to the table is he's your wingman. You are not going to do it alone. And if you have stress in your life, be it on the marital side or you're physically, you're not making the time to stay in shape, plus the nuts and bolts or the economics of your business, man, it's nice to have a wingman. And you have, you're a wingman to 52 of them, it sounds, and probably even more over your career. And it's a huge value add. I mean, it's not the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, sort of, as like you said, untangling the nets, but, you know, it's really helping you stay on a path. And I pushed him to go into coaching because it was a big transition for him. He had a very good job. He's been doing it for 15 years. He had a huge reputation, but he knew in college, he's like, what is this coaching thing? I really like it. And then by his mid forties, you know, he went off to do it and I was pushing, I provoked and pushed and he does the same. So it's, it's nice to have that type of support, which is very different than a partner um, because there's a different kind of agenda there. And there's two things that add to it for me. One in particular, the confidentiality is really, really important. I work in confidential situations, you know, the CEO or the emerging leader knows, cause it's not uncommon for me to get an emerging leader that works for you. And I go, how's it going? I hear nothing but great things about you. I'm so glad you were assigned to me. And they go, I'm dying. I can't tell John again that I don't know what I'm doing. So we learn right away how to learn without telling our bosses we don't know what we're doing or how to not say in a big board meeting, you know, I don't actually know. And so we do a lot of work with emerging leaders on how to learn. 
But then the other thing is just the value of the of the humility in the conversation. Like, I do not know it all. You do not know it all. But we're able to get behind the scenes and, like, game things out. Like, an example is my board of directors is killing me. They're into my staffing. They're into my budget. They're into my buildings. Okay, well, let's. what if we use the power of the agenda to rebalance the power between the board of directors and the executive? Okay, how do we do that? Well, maybe we, they want three big things. So maybe we take one of those things that we agree with and we put that on a consent agenda. The other two that we're choking on, we put one to an ad hoc committee and we staff that up from the executive and we add, for example, because we have the staff, they don't, board of directors, we put staff recommendations on there. So we drive them to the answers. We also stage things out. The next one is on the next board of directors agenda, which is actually six months from now. And we'll study it in between. So we start to play air traffic control. But I am not working with, nor are you or your partner working with people that are remedial. We're working with people that are big time and, um, and are looking for input. Fantastic. Last thing I want to I want to mention is um, doing what makes you happy, John. A lot of the coaching I do is people will say, for example, I want to be a family person. I want a family firm. I want to have a family culture. Or I don't want to get myself too stressed out. Or I do want to go for that job. And then when I hear the briefing, it doesn't line up. So what I hear from you is you said the things that make you happy. Passive income so you can spend more time with your family. Check and check. Surrounding yourself with brilliant people. Check. Creating something that's never been done before is really important to you. You're not trying to follow your footsteps. You're actually doing something unique and then spinning out. I mean, in some ways, you're living. I see so many incongruencies as a business coach. And I urge you to listen to them with your employees when you're coaching, when you're getting coached, incongruencies throughout. But I don't hear that from you. I hear nonlinear for sure. If you're going to be successful, it's not always straight to it. It can be a little bit more like the stock market. Your Super Bowl analogy was graphic, frankly, and it could be any of us. But you are you really never lost fidelity to the things that made you happy. People get over their skis and they work on inertia and they get to very high places and they're miserable. And I see a fair number of them during the day because the first thing I ask is, how are you? And I always look at the top left of my corner and it starts with busy, stressed, tired, way more times than I wanted to. So I just urge folks and I know that I'm listening and know John's <laughs> listening. Are you doing the things you're trying to do at least? Yeah. I don't know how to operate that other way. I just didn't. So I, it wasn't even a path for me. I do tell my kids, like, you might want to look a little to your mother as a role model of how to work really hard. If she was a CPA and she cranked. But if you want to look to me on how to maybe work smart and really prioritize what's important to you, but it comes with risk. And as I said, I have failed, but Nick, I was pretty happy poor. You know what I mean? I was, I was like, okay, whatever. I just, so I don't have a few extra toys. I, I, I make a little living and, it, and it's good enough. Um, but I was not going to compromise the things that were really important to me. And at the same time, man, I got lucky. I've been very lucky. Maybe I've made some of my own luck um, without question, but I would last six months in a job and someone's just going to come and go, you're, you're terrible at this because you're miserable and we've now fired you. I um, mean, I don't think I've worked for anyone since I was 22. My last waiter job at 23, maybe. That's just, again, I, I've done some ups and downs, but I, I kind of had to do it my own way just because there was no other way to do it. <laughs> it just wasn't. Well, we'll leave it at that, John. Thank you so much. Amazing job. It's been uh, just a treat to learn from you. I have a ridiculous number of pages and notes on my desk. A couple of times I forgot there were other people on this uh, listening to this podcast because I started geeking out as if you were the coach and I was a student. Thank you so much to our producer, Daniel Link, Riley Byrne and Mark Byrne at Podigy and Alex Warner on research. See you next month on Together at the Top. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Together at the Top thrives off listeners like you. To stay connected, follow our socials in the show notes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We will be releasing our show on the last Tuesday of every month. See you next time. At Nick Warner Consulting, we exist to coach and consult motivated professionals. I meet with you on Zoom in focused 90-minute sessions, working toward your goals and developing next-level business skill sets. My job is to add value to your organization and your career. To learn more, visit www.nickwarnerconsulting.com or call me directly at 916-765-3576.